All right, hello everybody. Uh, we're gonna go over the 2020 protocol update. Uh, there's actually only uh, one protocol that's been updated uh, from the Office of EMS. So we're gonna go through this really quickly. Um, please make sure to answer the questions as you move through the presentation. And then there will be a final uh, protocol test at the end. And then we'll give you credit for your two hours of continuing uh, education for the protocols. So without further ado, here we go. So protocol 9106 is the medication, excuse me, the medical communication policy. It was approved by the Office of EMS, the EMS Advisory Council, and the MPCC, or the Medical Policy Care Committee. Uh, and it goes into effect on February 15th. And as I mentioned previously, this update is worth two hours of CE credit. So the entire policy uh, has been revamped uh, and to me it's a little bit cleaner and more streamlined than the old version so we're going to walk through that so OEMS protocols are designed to allow EMS personnel the ability to provide a wide variety of treatments to many types of patients by utilizing offline protocols however since some since protocols cannot cover all situations online medical direction is essential so EMS personnel are expected to contact medical command for both online or offline medical direction as outlined in these protocols. Transporting to an emergency department or any time additional consultation is needed by the provider. This provides the hospital early notification and the provider's legal protection and protocol guidance as necessary. Additional EMS personnel should notify additionally EMS personnel should notify medical command on interfacility transports being transferred to an ER not less than 15 minutes prior to your arrival. In order to provide the most efficient and accurate communication between the provider and the medical command operator, we're going to talk about the procedures they want you to use. The patient handoff transfer of care. This is a formal exchange of information between the receiving health care providers and EMS personnel that pertain to the overall scene, patient presentation, what care was rendered, and the response to that care rendered prior to arrival at the receiving facility. This helps to reduce or alleviate repeated services, confusion, and medication errors. So the Office of EMS says that you must follow this EMS timeout report, and this is a verbal exchange of information to provide that continuity of care, and it follows the MIST format. MIST stands for Mechanism of Injury or Medical Complaint, Injuries or Illness, Signs and Symptoms, and then Treatment Rendered. So when we talk about the mechanism of injury and medical complaint, they want to know the name, age, sex, the location of the patient when found, onset of injuries or symptoms, the description or cause of the injury, and the details of the injury. And then you move into I for injuries or illness. We're looking at pain, deformity, injury patterns, or new disabilities, and the results of tests such as your ECGs, uh, your stroke neuroassessments, and blood glucose. When we move into the signs and symptoms, of course, they want to know those signs and symptoms, the duration, location, or any modifiers of the symptoms. We want to know the age of the patient, the pertinent medical history, and include a set of vital signs. Now, the vital signs need to include not only your first set, what the lowest blood pressure was in a current set. Then when we move into treatment, we're looking at tubes, lines, fluids, oxygen delivery description, medications that have been administered or any stabilization that was completed, um, whether it applied dressings or tourniquets, defibrillation, pacing, and other treatments. And then we also want to let them know what the treatment or the response to that treatment was. Were the symptoms relieved, improved? Did they get worse or was there no change? And then finally, in the handoff report, the patient handoff report shall be written documentation of minimal set of data that shall be provided to the receiving facility prior to EMS departure. This does not take the place of an EPCR, which may be required by the receiving facility at a later time. The minimal data must be provided includes the following information. The agency name and the name of the caregivers, patient's name, the chief complaint and history, 
vital signs, level of consciousness, and pertinent physical findings, the pertinent past medical history, medications, and allergies, and the treatment rendered. In the initial call-in procedure, when you do your initial call-in procedure, you are trying to effectively identify the level of interaction required to manage the patient, and you're going to use the following information. Now, one of the things that you will notice with this is the removal of the status one or status two delta. We talked about delta and Charlie. Those have been taken out, and this is what you will provide. So you have the initial call requirements. Call nine and channel C are the initial call frequencies. You're going to provide your squad and unit number. You're going to provide your destination and the time or the ETA, and then what you have or what you need. So what is that situation where there is a BLS or an ALS uh, transport, trauma, stroke, STEMI, um, if you require um, MCP orders or a conference. Then there's, we have to look at the methods for contacting medical command, and we have two general methods that are utilized. Either it's by UHF, VHF, or IRP radio, or you're utilizing a phone line, whether that be a landline or more commonly the cellular phone. So direct radio contract with, contact with medical command is preferred method for contact while responding to a call, transporting a patient or on the scene of a motor vehicle collision, or other non-residential incident. Depending on the area of the state, this may be accomplished best uh, by using UHF, VHF, or IRP radio frequencies. Your phone, or whether it be landline or cellular, should be used whenever the patient's location and condition permit. Phones provide a great amount of security for discussion of sensitive patient information, however, when in a mobile unit, phones are not a substitute for radio contact if coverage is available. Providers may use the local number of the medical command center or the toll-free 800 number for their specified region. So the detail within those call requirements when you contact medical command should be as follows. After medical command has answered the EMS initial call and assigned a frequency to take the full report, you want to provide the following. The age and sex of the patient, the chief complaint or mechanism of injury, a brief history of the physical or brief history of the present illness, pertinent past medical history, pertinent medications, allergies, vital signs, Glasgow comma, excuse me, Glasgow comma scale, stroke score, ECG findings, the assessment and treatment rendered, if you need any orders to request, and then updated ETA and destination. If the patient's condition changes or new complaints develop, the medical command should be contacted with updated findings and treatment. And it is understood that not all information listed in D1 on this protocol is required for every patient. So your provider should make every effort to provide a complete and thorough report reflective of the patient presentation. So, the section E in the protocol talks about performance improvements, and your EMS field providers and medical command operators shall have the ability to identify performance improve, improvement opportunities. These may manifest in recognition of a job well done or as an opportunity to improve. The EMS providers may at any time request a call to be flagged for review. The MedCom operator will do so and follow up will be provided to the EMS provider and the administrator. Anytime a request, requested order is denied, the call will automatically be flagged for review and follow-up will be provided to the EMS provider and administrator. And then finally, the medical comm operator may at any time flag a call for review and follow-up will be provided to the EMS provider and administrator. If the provider is unable to contact medical command, EMS personnel may continue to follow the appropriate protocols in the best interest of the patient. However, the provider must then immediately upon arrival at the receiving facility contact medical command by phone and provide a full patient report and the method, time, and location of unsuccessful efforts to reach medical command. 
If this report is made prior to leaving the receiving facility, no further reporting is required. If medical command is not contacted prior to, to leaving the receiving facility by law, the provider must submit a report, which can be found in Appendix H of the protocols, to the State Office of EMS on the appropriate form within 48 hours. Failure to do so could be grounds for suspension or even legal action.